Thank you very much, Michal. Now, to follow up on that activity, we're going to have a presentation on Ireland's land and marine biodiversity from Dr. Ferdia Marnell and from Professor Tasman Crow. So, to give you a brief introduction to both of them, Dr. Ferdia Marnell is from the National Parks and Wildlife Services. He's a zoologist in the, in, and, and manages the National uh, Survey and Monitoring Programs for mammals, amphibians, and reptiles. He also provides the scientific advice to underpin policy for vertebrate conservation and management. He's a member of the steering group group for the new European Mammal Atlas Project, the IUCN's Otter Specialist Group and the UNEP Eurobats Advisory Committee. He's managing projects on the Natterjack toads, pine martens, bats, whales and hares and has very kindly um, agreed to address us here today. In tandem with, and they, they're not a, a regular duo, um, they've agreed to do a, a double presentation for us today and he'll speak with um, Taz, who you know from the EAG, to give you a little bit more background on him. He's from the School of Biology and Envi Environmental Science at UCD. He's a marine ecologist with particular interest in research applicable to environmental policy and is a member of uh, Cambridge University Press's Ecology, Biodiversity and Conservation series. Um, as we also know, he's a member of Ireland's National Biodiversity Forum and of Future Earth Ireland. So please give them a warm welcome for their presentation on Ireland's land and marine biodiversity. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation to be here. It's a real, it's a real privilege to talk to you. Um, my task in 15 minutes is to introduce you to Ireland's biodiversity up above the high water mark, and then Taz is going to take over and take you out to sea after that. So it's quite a daunting task, I must say, and I'm going to have to tear into it. Um, it's mainly lovely slides. I hope you'll just sit back and enjoy it and just sort of absorb uh, what is around us in Ireland today. Ireland's biodiversity is very much a product of our geography and our history uh, and also our climate. Um, we are situated, as you will know, on the edge of Europe. We have a, a wet oceanic climate in the west of Ireland. Those of you from the west of Ireland will know you get three meters of rain every year in the west of Ireland. It's significantly drier on the east, but that three meters of rain produces an awful lot of wetlands, and Ireland is actually very, very important for wetlands, and also for peatlands, which you've heard mentioned already a couple of times today. In terms of our geography, you'll notice, and you'll have heard this in your Leaving Cert geography, we're, we're a saucer. So most of our uplands are around the edge, around the edge of the Ireland. Um, and the, the midlands are tend to be lowlands. And again, that leads to different types of habitats forming, particularly, particularly wetlands. Um, we also have a very long coastline, over 7,000 kilometers of coastline, which we sometimes take for granted. But again, coastal habitats, which are many, uh, many folds, uh, are well represented in Ireland. History is also very important. 12,000 years ago, the slide on the right here, the image on the right is a representation of what Ireland looked like 12,000 years ago. We were largely covered in ice, and Ireland looked a bit like Greenland does now. So we were mostly ice and tundra. Not many species survived that. Only specialist species have survived that. So most of our biodiversity that's here in Ireland today has developed here since the ice retreated. The ice started retreating about 10, 11,000 years ago. Initially, Ireland was connected to mainland Europe. So this image on the right would show you that connectivity. And then as ice melted, that allowed some species to move back from continental Europe as conditions got warmer here. But as ice melted, sea levels also rose. And eventually, Ireland became an island again. And at that point, no more animals or plants could get in except the ones that could fly, basically. So a lot of the species, for example, that even got as far as the UK, like snakes and moles, they never made it as far as Ireland. So what we have in Ireland now is unique. There's no other country with the same biodiversity as us. Um, it's our own special biodiversity, um, and what I'm hoping to do is to uh, give you a quick introduction to it. We have about 30,000 species in Ireland, the last time we counted, more or less. Um, so you won't be able to see the words there, but basically the column on the left is, is insects. So we have about 11,000 different types, different species of insects in Ireland. The next column on the left is the other invertebrates, so spiders and worms, the thousands of different species that live in our soil that you might never even see. We have over 6,000, nearly 8,000 species of fungi, different types of mushrooms. Uh, we only have about 2,000 uh, species of plant. And if you go right over to the right-hand side, the big charismatic groups, mammals, amphibians, reptiles, fish, we've hardly any of those at all. So a lot of our biodiversity, most of our biodiversity, is over on the left-hand side. It tends to be small, it doesn't tend to have backbone, it doesn't tend to feature on the, on the RT news uh, very often. Once the ice retreated, our 
landscape started to develop. And 10,000 years ago, it was a lot different than it is now. So as I said, initially, it was sort of tundra, and then gradually scrubland developed. By 2,000 years ago, much of Ireland was covered in forestry. Then man arrived, things started to change a little bit. And then when agriculture really kicked in, significant changes started happening to our landscape. So if you go to Google Maps now, which is great fun, I'm sure you all do this from time to time, and zoom in, this is typically what you'll see. So about 65% of our landscape is agricultural land. Most of it is green. It's grass, it's silage, it's pasture. Uh, another 10% of our landscape is forestry. So that's about 75% of the Irish landscape is relatively intensively managed. Most of our biodiversity is in the other 25%, those habitats that are less uh, heavily managed by man. And what I want to do now is I just want to go through five of those really quickly, uh, show you the different type of habitats that are well represented in that 25%, and just introduce you to some of the species that you might see there uh, if you go poking around. So the first one I want to mention is peatlands, and I saw Bob Watson mentioned this, and I think Michal has mentioned as well. Peatlands are really well represented in Ireland. This goes back to the three meters of rain that we get. It really helps develop peatlands. Peatlands have been around a long time. Some of our peatlands actually date back 10,000 years, and we can do cores in them and find out exactly how long they've been around, and some of them are really, really ancient. They're our oldest ecosystems in Ireland, and they're probably the last real wilderness that we have left in Ireland. So vast areas of our uplands are covered in blanket bogs, but we also have peatlands in the lowlands as well. Mosses and lichens make up the ground flora of peatlands. So these are the these are the species of plant that actually create peatlands over hundreds and thousands of years. Um, but above those and beyond those, you can actually see beautiful species like bog cotton. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. Very, very common species in our, in our central boglands and also in our, in our upland peatlands as well. And then if you get into the more specialist species, this is the marsh, saxifrage, it's only found in Mayo. So a lot of our species are sort of unique to certain parts of the country for historical or climate reasons or habitat reasons. And this is one of our, one of our rare and protected plants, the marsh saxifrage. One of our iconic mammals, the uh, Irish hare, the mountain hare, is actually found all over Ireland. In, in continental Europe, there's another species of hare called the European hare. And this hare, the mountain hare, is only found in mountains. But in Ireland, we only have one hare and it's adapted to the Irish environment, and it's actually found in lowlands and in uplands, but it's quite common in, in peatlands. And finally, just one of our more obscure species, uh, we have uh, several hundred mollusks of different types in Ireland. This is the Kerry slug. This is named after the place that it was first discovered, in Kerry. It's the next nearest location that you'll find it is in Iberia. So it's not found in Britain, it's not found in Northern Europe, except for Southwest Ireland and Portugal and Spain. So one of our more unusual species. I mentioned that about 10% of our land is covered in forestry, but that's intensively man managed forestry for wood. We have about 2% natural woodland left, and they're really, really important. Now, to some extent, that is um, helped by the fact that we have a very good hedgerow system in Ireland, and although hedgerows don't provide the same amount of habitat or provide the same niches for species that woodlands do, they do provide very essential connectivity across our agricultural landscape. So if you fly again, if you fly across Europe and look down most of continental Europe, there's almost no hedgerows. It's not a thing that they do. Um, but in Ireland, we still have a very, very um, elaborate and detailed system of hedgerows, and they provide very important habitats for a lot of our species. But it's the native woodlands where things really get exciting. And if you have native woodlands near you, you'll see that they're carpeted in bluebells at the moment. We have nine different species of bats which all rely on woodlands to some extent. This is the long-eared bat. We have eight other species. Um, they are fabulous. They provide really, really important services for us in terms of eating insects. So bats are great. I could talk about bats for an hour, but I only have about seven minutes left, so I better keep going. Uh, hopefully all of you at some stage have seen a red squirrel. Um, they were nearly extinct 20 years ago. They were on our endangered list. We were really worried about them. And then a strange thing happened. Um, this animal started to recover. And what what seems to have happened is that the grey squirrel, which was introduced into Ireland 100 years ago from North America, began expanding its range, and it's a much bigger, more aggressive squirrel. And it actually outcompeted the red squirrel, and the red squirrel was wiped out of large areas of the Midlands of Ireland. Then the pine martin, which is the species on the right there, which is a native predator, it started to recover. So the pine martin had been persecuted for a long time. It had been poisoned using strychnine. Eventually, it was protected. Strychnine was banned in the 80s. And gradually, the pine martin started to expand its range. And it took a fancy to the gray squirrels. 
So suddenly, we had a predator chasing up the gray squirrels. The gray squirrels started to decline and have been declining steadily now for the last 25 years or so. And where the gray squirrel has disappeared, the red squirrel is coming back again. So it's a really nice example of how species are interlinked and how they can relate to each other and how the impact of one can actually directly or indirectly cause an impact on another species. Another interesting species, woodpecker. We didn't have woodpeckers in Ireland at all until about 50, 30 years ago. The population in the UK is doing really well, so they've decided to expand, and they arrived in eastern Ireland, and they're now found almost everywhere in Ireland. Another great natural expansion of a, a beautiful species, and again, the woodlands of Ireland at the moment are often, you can often hear the drumming of this great spotted woodpecker in various parts of Ireland. Some of the rarest species that you really won't see unless you really look for them, things like this white prominent moth. We have 1,500 different species of moth in Ireland. And again, I could talk about them for an hour, but I only have four minutes left at this stage. The white prominent moth was considered extinct. It hadn't been seen for 100 years. And then it turned up again down near, uh, in Kerry, near Killarney, in some of the old birch woodlands. It only lives in old birch woodlands in Kerry. That's the only place it's found. Moth enthusiasts, and there are many of them, believe it or not, come over from the UK, especially to see this species, because they don't have it anywhere in the UK. And it's, as you can see, it's very beautiful. There, I'm, I'm a zoologist. I've been told I have to throw in plant species every so often, so here's one. This is, another, this is a beauty, beautiful species. I couldn't believe this when I saw the close-up photograph of it. Uh, St. Patrick's cabbage, a specialist stuff. Not particularly woodlands, really, I suppose, but I had to find somewhere to put it in, so I just thought you'd like to look at it. Um, again, especially the west coast of Ireland. Um, again, one of our rare plants. Very beautiful. Probably our most famous habitats uh, are associated with the burn. Um, the limestone pavement and the turlocks that occur in the burn. People come from all over the world to visit these habitats and to look at the plants and animals that live there. Um, they really think it's amazing. It is amazing. Uh, if you haven't wandered around the burn, you should really make a, make a, make a plan to do so over the summer. It's a spectacular um, habitat. The burn used to be a warm coral sea quite a long time ago, but it still has some strange associations with that warm habitat because the limestone heats up really well it captures the sun, and plants can survive in this habitat that can't survive anywhere else in Ireland. So we have a un unique assemblage of plants and animals in the burn, which, is, which makes it very, very special. The turlocks, as their name suggests, tour look, are dry lakes. So they get wet in the winter, they flood in the winter, and then they dry up in the summer. And that, again, creates weird habitats that only certain species can thrive in. One of my favorite species, the species I did my PhD on, I could talk about for days, never mind hours, the smooth newt, spotted newt, uh, our only newt, absolutely stunning species. It breeds in ponds and lakes like the turlocks, and then it disperses onto land, so it's perfectly adapted to, to a habitat just like this. And there's loads of diving beetles. We have over 100 diving beetles in Ireland. They love these sort of pondy habitats. Um, and then we've, as I mentioned, we've many, many other types of invertebrates, such as this rat spider, which you'll find in these uh, habitats in, in the burn. In the grasslands around the turlocks, then we have a vast flora, a, a fantastic assemblage of different species, some species that you won't own, you'll only find in the Alps, and then some species that are lowland species. This is the grass of Parnassus, a beautiful species that is associated with sort of wet, wet grasslands. And of course, we have lots of knapweeds, which provide really important nectar for pollinators. And then, did I mention that we have 1,500 different species of moths? There'll be a test at the end of this, by the way. This moth is the burn green. It's only found in the burn. It's one of our unique species. It's spectacular. And again, moth enthusiasts, and there are many of them, come to the burn every year to, to look at it. And again, you can see why. It's got this fabulous green cloak around its shoulders. Beautiful species. Pressing on remorselessly, as my chemistry teacher used to say when we said we didn't understand what he was talking about, fresh waters. We have, despite genuine concerns about pollution, uh, in Ireland, we have still some really good examples of freshwater habitats, lakes and, and rivers. Um, the midland lakes, like this one here, are really important for the white-clawed crayfish. So this is a relatively small lobster-like invertebrate that lives in these lakes. Elsewhere in Europe, this species has been threatened by the introduction of non-native species. So North American crayfish that have been brought to the continent and grown for food and then have escaped or been released into the wild. And they carry a plague with it, which kills the native crayfish. So Ireland is one of the last refuges for this invertebrate, the white-tailed crayfish. And of course, our wetlands are really important, particularly in wintertime, for vast numbers of wintering waterbirds, like these hooper swans. 
if you get down on your hands and knees, you'll see these fantastic little leaf beetles that live on the vegetation around the edge of our lakes. Spectacular species. In our rivers, we're particularly famous for our salmon and for our otters. We have really good populations of both of those, particularly when where water conditions are good. Um, and then, I was interested, Michal mentioned this species already, the freshwater pearl mussel. This species only survives in the most pristine of rivers. It's the rivers that really have escaped all sorts of pollution. Um, it's almost extinct in the rest of Europe. We have some of the best populations left here, particularly in the southwest and the west of Ireland. This species can live to 120 years. It's our oldest living species. Finally, just to wrap up, coastal habitats. 7,000 kilometers of coast, we have lots of different types of coastal habitat, and they're actually very well represented here in Ireland. So that's shingle beaches and sand dunes like this one. This is Sheskin Moor in Donegal, any of you up that part of the world, but there's other great sand dune systems, for example, in Inch and Kerry, one of my favorite ones. Um, we also have salt marshes, and there's many, many. It's a complex of coastal habitats. Our coastal habitats are our first line of defense against sea level rise. They're really they're crucial. On the shingle beaches, so that those bits of rock at the top of the tide, you have specialized plants like this oyster plant that grow there. They are especially adapted to living in a habitat that moves and that covers in the sea, gets covered in the sea once every you know, couple of weeks. So again, spe only specialist plants will survive here. You're all familiar with marron grass. Marron grass is, the, is the, the first grass that traps the sand that's blowing around on the beach and allows dunes to form in the first place. And when those dunes form, and you can see in the picture in the background there, they're stable dunes. Other habitats can then form in amongst the, the, dunes, the, the, the dune humps. And you get dune slacks forming, for example, which are special ponds that only occur in dunes. And in the southwest of Ireland, we have this very rare species, the natterjack toad, that only lives really in dune slacks. Again, I could talk about that species for a long time. Marsh fritillary, a species associated with dunes and also with mac air, another one of our coastal habitats. It lays its eggs uh, on the grasses there, very beautiful species. Um, and then we have this large marsh grasshopper. Again, who knew? We have lots of grasshoppers and crickets in Ireland. Yes, we do. And I was, again, I was reminded about putting in the odd plant. Apparently, orchids are really pretty to look at. So there is a pretty orchid to look at. That's the bee orchid, again, associated with our coastal habitats and many other habitats in Ireland as well. That has been very much a whistle-stop tour through our terrestrial uh, habitats. It was just a really quick introduction. Um, I sort of tried to take you from the uplands right down to the coast. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Taz, who's going to take you out to sea. Thank you very much.